brand new comedy news show, like The Daily Show, but if Jon Stewart was a transsexual, so exactly like The Daily Show. <laughs> I'm your host, Ella Yerman. <laughs> Tonight, we're gonna talk about the news, but before we do that, we have to address a question that has haunted the minds of anyone who has ever seen Amy Schumer post on Instagram. What is going on? What is this white bitch saying? And why is she on my screen? <laughs> Look, I get it, we're a late night show, which is traditionally a network program where a strange cis man in a suit with a melted face appeases liberals. And don't worry, I can do some of that if you need it. <laughs> Donald Trump, he's fugly. <laughs> and jail is not always bad. <laughs> but I'm different from other late night hosts for one simple reason. If my staff were ever mistreated, they would actually kind of like it. <laughs> I'm also transgender, and gay, and Gen Z. I'm Tucker Carlson's worst nightmare. <laughs> Our generation has been uniquely politicized. Climate change, rising cost of living, a healthcare system designed to kill people, advancements in surveillance from evil tech companies, school shooter drills plastered into our memory, Genocide Joe thriving as geriatric millennials act sawy awkward turtle cuckoo sauce while project managing at Boeing. Ugh. <laughs> Things are so bad for us as a country that me being trapped in the studio and chained to the desk feels like more of a social safety net than most people have. Like, I'm here. I won't leave, and I think this desk has termites, so <laughs> I'm basically a homeowner. <laughs> as part of the generation that has to actually inherit the consequences of everyone else's decisions, we have a sense of urgency, and that's why we're doing this every four weeks. <laughs> for right now. You know, until we get funding from the Koch Foundation and totally sell out. And then I'll pay my writers. <laughs> but, you know, actually, a slower production cycle lets us spend more time going in-depth on what's important. Contrary to what you might see on TV, having informed opinions takes time, and we want to do it well. We're not in the business of 30-second takes. We leave that to the experts, middle-aged pundits on CNN, to answer <laughs> questions like, how fascist is too fascist? <laughs> and should leftists who criticize Joe Biden be placed on a torture instrument and stretched out like taffy? Or should we just put bugs in their shirts? <laughs> and now, before I continue sounding like one of those billionaires who drinks blood, here's what's been happening in the last couple of weeks. An NYPD officer lost part of his left finger after a suspect of reckless driving bit him, proving that the only thing that can stop a good guy with a gun is a weird little guy with a strong mouth. <laughs> Florida State Representative Angie Nixon begged on the floor for a Gaza ceasefire, asking how many dead Palestinians will be enough. In response, Florida Representative Michelle Salzman shouted, all of them. With this comment, Salzman brings home first prize in the most deranged bloodthirsty Floridian contest, narrowly beating out guy who ate a man's face, and also guy who threw an alligator through a Wendy's drive-thru, and also Matt Gates. <laughs> The video chat website Omegle shut down this week after 15 years. Now where will 12 year olds go to get groomed? All that's left is school and church and sports and church and Drake's DMs. Earlier this month, the Biden administration unveiled a national strategy to counter Islamophobia. The main safety measure is to ask American Muslims to please wait on getting hate crimes until after visiting the polls in 2024. <laughs> A new policy could prohibit Chicago police officers from joining hate groups. But we feel unsafe everywhere else, said a cop, while throwing a rape kit into a blender and tasing your grandma. <laughs> Patrick Dempsey was named People Magazine's 2023 Sexiest Man Alive, which I feel kind of overshadows the fact that I won People Magazine's 2023 Sexiest Woman Alive who's been hit by a car 12 times. <laughs> That's a real accomplishment. <laughs> A Brooklyn bar is allowing patrons to practice being a DJ, forcing bar employees to practice living through hell. <laughs> Snoop Dogg announced that he has quit smoking after realizing that pot is a gateway drug to somehow having 5,000 jobs. <laughs> South Carolina Senator Tim Scott abruptly ended his 2024 presidential bid, shocking even his campaign staff because they thought that after six weeks in Iowa, you have to carry to term. <laughs> A new report shows many Democratic lawmakers are ignoring phone calls demanding a ceasefire in Gaza. After learning that calls will likely go to voicemail instead of reaching a person, millennials have started calling way, way more. <laughs> Moving on to our first story tonight. Arraignment hearings began last week for nearly two dozen protesters indicted on RICO charges in Atlanta. To give us some background on this issue, please welcome revolutionary pundit Olafemi Z. <laughs> Thank you, 
for that unseasoned introduction, white <laughs> devil. <laughs> On September 5th, Fulton County, Georgia prosecutors brought state RICO charges against 61 people protesting the construction of Cop City, a $90 million tax-funded police training facility the Atlanta Police Department plans to build over 85 acres of Wheelani Forest Land. Can you explain what RICO is? I'm getting to it, Vanilla Vulture. Calm your titties. <laughs> RICO is the Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act, a federal law enacted under Nixon in 1970, allegedly meant to target the mafia, but because the law focused primarily on patterns of behavior rather than criminal acts, it can and has been applied very broadly. The Stop Cop City movement is a decentralized group of activists working to prevent the construction of the police facility. Some camp out on the land and some collect signatures, fundraise, and pass out flyers. These are all common tactics for voicing dissent, and they're protected under the First Amendment. But they're cited in the indictment as overt acts of conspiracy. And reading the indictment is insane. It calls terms like mutual aid, solidarity, and collectivism dangerous jargon embraced by anarchists to maintain loyalty. These words basically mean sharing and togetherness. If that's dangerous jargon, then the Care Bears are a terrorist organization. <laughs> and the charges themselves are insane. People charged with conspiracy for sending $38.66 for kitchen materials. Imagine being brought up on federal charges for a DoorDash order. Hey, I mean, maybe that's what it'll take to cut down on my food budget. You think this shit is a joke, mail monkey? <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, how can a grand jury choose to prosecute based on this? Because grand juries aren't juries. They're tools of the carceral state. Okay, but you called our sound guy a tool of the carceral state earlier. <laughs> you damn right I did. <laughs> Fuck you, Jeff. <laughs> the grand juries are worse. They're groups of people selected in secret, led by prosecutors, and not screened for bias or prejudice like trial jurors. In fact, the only two countries that still use the grand jury system are the U.S. and Liberia. Are, are you saying we should abolish the grand jury system? What I'm saying, Winter Wallaby, is <laughs> the grand jury system, these prosecutors and f 12. <laughs> this is a matter of life and death. In January of this year, 26 year old forest defender Manuel Tortuguita Tehran was murdered by Georgia State troopers during a multi agency raid on the Defend Atlanta Forest encampment. Police shot Tortuguita 57 times while their hands were up, but claimed that Tortuguita shot at them first. Spoiler alert body cam footage captures an officer explicitly stating that the trooper was shot by fellow cops fire. And an independent autopsy showed that Tort Tortuguita was shot sitting in a meditation pose and found no gunshot residue on their person. God, that's horrifying. And what's more horrifying is that the indictment blatantly lies about Tortuguita's death, claiming that evidence demonstrates that Tortuguita shot first, despite there being no evidence of that. And it dismisses any support for Tortuguita as a propaganda campaign against police. Mind you, this indictment was filed in August, months after the independent autopsy and body cam footage were released. So they know they lying. By the way, in October, a special prosecutor examined the GBI file on the case and decided not to press charges against any of the troopers who killed Tortuguita. Wait, so you're saying the state investigated itself and then decided it did nothing wrong? That's right, you carton of oat milk in the shape of a woman. <laughs> and when protesters posted flyers naming the police officers responsible for Tortuguita's death, information they obtained legally via the Georgia Bureau of Investigation's own public records, they were charged with felony intimidation of an officer of the state and stalking. This is a clear example of the state power using its fist to kneel on the people's backs. Wait, hold on. How would you kneel with your fist? Shut up, bleach demon! <laughs> Let me mix my metaphors! With this indictment, Georgia prosecutors and the Fulton County Grand Jury have effectively criminalized dissent. Yeah, I mean, I know that in Georgia, felons can't even apply for a pardon until five years after they've finished serving their sentence. And that pardon can't be issued by a governor. Correct you are, you sentient paper towel. <laughs> so if the state gets its way, people will be serving inescapable decades-long sentences for filming the police, writing a cab, and posting on Instagram. We gotta stop this. And I realize the rules of this show prevent me from making any explicit calls to action. So I can't tell you to support the Wialani Defense Society or find out more information what, on what you can do to help by going to stopcopcitysolidarity.org. 
Nor can I tell you to stop supporting the corporations financially backing Comp City, such as Bank of America, AT&T, Morgan Stanley, and Nationwide Insurance, just to name a few. No, not Nationwide. They're supposed to be on our side. <laughs> nationwide is on the pig side, my abominable snow wench. <laughs> And I know I can't ask viewers to donate to the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, which provides critical legal and bail support for protesters, or to donate to Tortuguita's Family Fund, but I can stare at Ella until she donates. I mean, you don't have to do that. I, I want to help. All right, I'm just making sure. I know how duplicitous you napkin Americans can be. <laughs> and finally, I'd like to just say this with my whole chest in case you forgot. It's 12 over here all day, every day. Thank you for that story, Olafemi. You know, it's very brave of you to do this. I mean, the law has been applied so broadly that they could get you on RICO charges just for being here. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, I mean, if they can charge people for donating to mutual aid funds and, and making zines and writing ACAP, they can absolutely get you for coming on a public access show and shouting F 12. So brave, so admirable. Give it up. <laughs> I would like to formally retract my previous statements. Wait, what? I publicly disavow Ella Yerman, denounce my association with Late Stage Live, and pledge unwavering fealty to the police state. You can't be serious. Bitch, I can't go to prison. Prison? For saying fuck the police? Yeah, I mean, that's why I thought you were doing this story, because no one should go to prison for voicing dissent. I'm doing this story because MSNBC won't return my call. <laughs> and I can't go to prison for voicing dissent because I can't fight. Come on, Olafemi. Stop calling me that. My name is Jennifer Thomas. <laughs> and if you put this on the internet, I will call my uncle and he will sue the shit out of your raggedy ass little show. Who's your uncle? Clarence Thomas. Okay, <laughs> that's enough out of you. Olafemi Z, everybody. <laughs> and now, before we catch a Supreme Court lawsuit, here's a word from our sponsors.
story tonight. 2023 is the year of the rabbit, the imploding submarine, and also the snarky picket sign. We've got nurses, actors, restaurant servers, all trying to be comedians. I mean, uh, fighting for fair labor conditions. It's hot strike summer, baby! Or uh, fall, and also probably winter. We're in a labor renaissance. Workers are standing up and the big bosses are feeling the heat. It's a real life David and Goliath, except this time there's a million Davids and they've all got clothes on, which is a shame because I would love to see some of those actors striking oiled up with their little slingshot over their shoulder. Sorry. Uh, one of the reasons we're seeing so many strikes happening right now is that the COVID-19 pandemic, ever heard of it, really fucked a lot of shit up. A massive number of working age Americans have been unable to work due to uh, being dead from COVID. <laughs> and older folks are retiring early, so the unemployment rate is way down, which is a good thing all by itself, except for, you know, the, the dead people. But a low unemployment rate also intrinsically strengthens workers' bargaining power. When there are fewer candidates available for every open job and prices are rising, workers have more power and become bolder in their demands for higher wages and benefits, which is why a whole bunch of actors went on strike. A whole bunch of writers went on strike. The UPS workers threatened to strike. Healthcare workers went on strike. Hospitality workers in Vegas went on strike. Postal workers threatened to strike. Starbucks and Amazon unionizing too. Now the auto workers are striking. Boo hoo. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> that was. I can't believe you guys made me do that! That was not funny. If I was paying you, I would cut your salaries. Anyway, the point is, a lot of striking, everywhere. The WGA and SAG strikes have gotten a lot of press because they include fancy people who can provide a lot of visibility, and it's exciting to see Tom Cruise talk about anything other than Scientology and riding a motorcycle up a cliff. That is good shit, baby! But so many people are fighting for better labor conditions. Grad students are on strike. Steel workers are on strike. My general sex appeal has been on strike since 1998. Hey. Ben Affleck used to be on strike from Benefer, but after years of negotiations, they are so back. For nearly half a century, the balance of power between workers and employers has been tilted toward the employer, and that is finally starting to shift. But how did we get here? Why is it happening now? Well, first off, if you haven't noticed, the cost of living today is too damn high. Ella's writers have noticed since they work for free. Guys, <laughs> this is a public access show and I legally can't pay you. You all agreed to do this. Are you editing the script in real time? Don't do that. Sorry, where was I? Right, okay. Um, it's more expensive than ever to live on planet Earth. Moody's Analytics reports that the average family is shelling out an extra $700 a month for the same stuff they bought two years ago. And if that wasn't enough, the Peterson Institute tells us that 80% of wages are in most industries aren't keeping up with this price hike. Kind of like how Ella can't keep up with the teleprompter. You guys, I swear to God. According to a June bank rate survey, almost half of Americans have less than three months of emergency savings. Every time my wage goes up, the price of everything else goes up, and it does me no good, reports one Michigan hardware store employee who works five days a week and is on call at another six nights a week at a different job, plus side hustles. Jesus Christ. And he already has to deal with showing everyone where on the mitten he lives every time it comes up. <laughs> Can this guy catch a break, please? The good news is, thanks to all this striking, CNBC says that the gap between wage growth and inflation might just squeeze itself shut by Q4 of 2024, whatever Q4 means. But there's still tons of work to be done to get there, especially because Americans' right to unionize and strike has been progressively eroded over the last half century. While more than 400,000 workers went on strike this year, post-World War II, one to four million Americans went on strike every single year. But then, in 1981, Ronald Reagan, take a shot, <laughs> fired all striking air traffic controllers, who he labeled as disloyal, sending a message that employers could permanently replace striking workers. This move paved the way for conservatives and corporations to demonize unions and strike fear into the working class over the next several decades. Cool, awesome, great job, Reagan. Soon after, court rulings like right-to-work laws led to a huge plunge in union membership, and as a union membership declined, income inequality increased, and Michigan hardware store workers have to work 14 nights a week just to live. That's two entire lives just to afford one. Who is this guy, Hannah Montana? <laughs> 
We do not support a Hannah Montana economy. In contrast, Joseph Robinette Biden is technically the most pro-union president we've ever had. Union between his face and the ground, cause that bitch stay falling. Union between his face and plastic surgery. Union between, between his wallet and genocide. Get off the stage, get off, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, my writers, everyone. Okay, yes, but he did put in the bare minimum to show nominal support for striking workers. In September, Biden became the first ever sitting U.S. president to join a picket line, making a public appearance at the United Auto Workers strike in Michigan as they struck against all three of Detroit's largest car makers, General Motors, the Ford Motor Company, and Chrysler. Having the president on the picket line was a small win for the union as it gave UAW workers more leverage in their negotiations, but it was also clearly a blatant PR move for Biden with the ultimate goal of securing the union's endorsement, come re-election, and painting Biden as a working class ally. As you can imagine, both parties found creative ways to be furious. Democrats are criticizing him for not staying neutral and giving in to progressives. Republicans are criticizing him for, I don't know, supporting people being able to live. <laughs> Great job, guys. And we don't really know what to do right now because he's funding war crimes, and that's bad, but also he did appoint a semi-decent National Labor Relations Board, so yay. <laughs> Look. In contrast to the Trump-appointed NLRB of 2017 to 2020, which consistently took pro-corporate stances and was actively hostile to unions, Biden's board has released a series of progressive rulings over the last three years that many analysts believe could revitalize the labor movement at large. And yeah, that doesn't even begin to make up for the war crimes. Like, at all. But it's something, right? It, it's better than not doing that. Look, basically what we're saying is you can't vote for who's on the labor board, but you can vote for their hiring manager. <laughs> sure, it's all a performance to win votes, but isn't a pro-union performance still better than union busting? I'll always take someone who can perform in bed over someone who busts their nut and pretends it's great for everyone. <laughs> Sorry, in this metaphor, is Biden performing in bed and Republicans are busting a nut? Reagan's busting a nut? What's happening? We're tired. We're not being paid. Just skip to the part about the four-hour work week. Bitch, you should have spent four minutes on this script. You know who you're starting to sound like? You're starting to sound a lot like her. I am not <laughs> Kim Kardashian. Yeah, she got a fat ass and a law degree. <laughs> All right, enough. Let's get back to the cars. No, no! The cars we were just talking about! Oh my God, Jesus Christ! On October 30th, the UAW union and the big three Detroit automakers reached an agreement. The terms broadly included a 25% general raise for auto workers, cost of living increases, and a brand new car! <laughs> just kidding. Imagine, haha. -ha. But this type of collective action works abroad, too. In September, 44,000 unionized workers in South Korea collectively bargained for a 12% annual pay increase to avoid a strike entirely. In July, the United States Teamsters also avoided a strike and signed a five-year renewal agreement with the UPS that helps 340,000 workers get better pay and health care. And SAG and the WGA both reached agreements with the studios in the last few months that bolstered protections against AI, codified streaming residuals, and expanded eligibility for health care insurance, uh, as well as other benefits. Because that's the thing. You don't just strike because you don't want to go to work. A strike is a threat to remind your employer that you have the leverage to make things better. And by the way, a strike can look like anything. In South Korea, women are striking from the patriarchy by leaving it behind entirely through the four Bs. Kion. The refusal of heterosexual marriage. Bichulsan. The refusal of childbirth. Uh, saying no to dating. And Bisexu. the rejection of heterosexual sexual relationships. And I, Ella Yerman, haven't given up another B. Barfing during blowjobs. <laughs> <sighs> it's been really hard. <laughs> there have also been various calls for a general strike over the past few years in response to things like police brutality and the genocide in Gaza. Unlike the strikes we've talked about so far, a general strike wouldn't be a specific union fighting for better working conditions, but instead all workers all across the country walking out of work and refusing to come back until the government affects real change. Like, say, not doing any more war crimes, which would be amazing, but it's also hard to do that. You can't just post a tweet, or sorry, an X, and expect all 207 million working age Americans to quit their jobs on the spot. And even if you could do it, it wouldn't do much good without a clear, unified set of goals and strategies. Effectively leveraging a nationwide action like a general strike requires real, strong union infrastructure all across the workforce, both to actually get anything out of the bargaining process and to provide ongoing support to the millions of workers who would suddenly be out of a job. Support like this 
doesn't currently it doesn't currently exist because as i've mentioned several times the u.s government in tandem with the corporations that pay their luxurious lobbying fees spent the last 60 years eroding worker protections uh, the threat of a general strike exposes one of the fundamental antagonisms at the heart of this country the state versus the populace Ooh, but Ella, I thought the state was just an extension of the will of the people. Mmm, no, read a book. <laughs> the state only serves to legitimize class oppression, which is, you know, the other fundamental antagonism at the heart of this country. Wow, America's heart is just like mine, full of antagonisms. <laughs> so yes, it is technically good that Biden appointed the labor board he did, but we need to be super duper clear here. Biden didn't do that out of the goodness of his heart. He did it because we bullied him into it, and now we have to take those rights we bullied him into giving us, turn right back around, and use them to bully him even harder. What I'm talking about is basically what some socialists like to call dual power, and what we here at Late Save Live like to call very good, smart politics. <laughs> it's the practice of working to consolidate power within existing institutions while simultaneously organizing to build new, independent counter-institutions. So, if... If we're all going to vote for Joe Biden next year, <laughs> like, are we? Maybe not. I don't know. If we are, we shouldn't do it because he's the most pro-union president. We should do it because he gave us an inch, and God damn it, we're gonna take a fucking mile, which is many, many inches. <laughs> we use the friendly NLRB he gave us to grab as much bargaining leverage as we can, and then we use that leverage to force him even further left, force him to pass even more labor protections, show up on even more picket lines, and then, hopefully, die of old age. <laughs> and while a general strike might not be feasible right this very second, that doesn't mean it's totally out of the question. After winning their strike earlier this year, the UAW, remember, from before, called on other unions across the country to synchronize their contracts' expiration dates with theirs, with the aim of building towards a mass action when all the contracts expire in May 2028. This is the kind of real, tangible first step that could lead to an actual general strike. But it's not the only step, because right now we just don't have the numbers. As of 2022, only 11% of American workers were in a union. How do we get those numbers up? By instilling a more pro-union culture in America. How do we do that? By bullying the government into passing labor protections and passing pro-union legislation. How do we do that? By amassing union power and using it to apply bargaining leverage. And oh my god, it just keeps going in circles. Everything is about labor and capitalism and labor and capitalism. And oh, I knew strikes and labor were about capitalism, but it feels like you can't talk about anything leftist without it coming back around to class politics and the L word. <laughs> Which is why we here at the show have an L word chart. Our L word isn't lesbian. It's labor, the thing that lesbians love to do, manually and emotionally. From now on, whenever we're talking about a subject that boils back down to class antagonisms and the importance of labor, instead of going on like a quasi-Marxist rabbit hole like I just did, we're gonna add it to this chart instead. Because everything comes back to labor, even this show, which is written and made for free. Okay. <laughs> which is why we're striking. Here we go, awesome. Throughout this essay, we exhibited how a strike is started. You did not do that. So all of you can help us strike against Ella, and then we will all go leave and work for the only good company left on Earth, Ben and Jerry's? <laughs> Ella pitches Ben and Jerry's flavors. Transgendary makes, yourself, makes you shit yourself like the Republicans when they see Ella. <laughs> Neapolite stage. Ella, you're Rocky Road. Ella, you're a Mel, like caramel. Oh, good. Late stage, but the stage is fudge. Late fudge live. Late fudge live? Oh, you know? Okay. It doesn't look that bad on paper. <laughs> if any of you know Ben or Jerry, please find me after the show. We'll be right back. <laughs> That's our show! Thank you to Brick, thank you to Octavia and Reed and my writers, thank you to Samara Slaughter.